And throughout the history, your history that you are telling us, you, you said it is quite important for all of the personal connections that you make with people, the people that mentored you, the people that you mentored. Yes. So how important do you think it is to keep in touch with what people are doing right now, for the people that work with you, and for the people that you work with to still know what you're doing? Well, I tell the people in the lab that the link that they form when they're working with me is always there. And it's not like we're in touch every day or every week, but anytime something comes up where I can uh, offer advice or they need to learn a technique that perhaps they didn't learn the first time, or if I've got some instrumentation laying around that they know they worked with when they were in my lab that they don't have at the moment, <coughs> I'm happy to let them use it or they can come back to the lab and, and do an experiment with me if, if they choose to. Um, other ways that that is manifested is if they're writing a grant or have some ideas for a grant, we can email, we can talk on the phone, that can help them focus their attention. I also get feedback from them on my thinking. One of the greatest things for me about working with young people is as I get older, it helps keep my thinking fresh, and I feel it helps me keep younger than I would otherwise be if I wasn't working with students. So, so once once we build that link of working together, that link is always there. And how easy do you find to keep in touch with people even if they're geographically quite far away? Because one of the things that's now instilled in every career investigator is the importance of geographic mobility within Europe and even outside. Yeah. Sometimes people want to settle down, keep roots, or at least be confined to a country. Do you think that it's important to do that when you have the possibility to do that? Sure. What, what, one of the nice things about the cities that we live in is, for example, email just makes it so, so easy to do. Uh, there's also Skype. I don't do Skype a lot, but if people want to do that, then we use that very effectively. And so the electronic communications that are facilitated by, by email. Mm -hmm. um, I, I still write manuscripts with people in Europe, and you, know, you can send them back and forth. Uh, you can arrange a call when we're both awake instead of two in the morning in one place and two in the afternoon in the other place and have conversations. It, it still works very effectively. It's not the same as being next to each other, sitting, you know, holding hands and things, but uh, it still works very effectively in terms of um, either writing grants or writing papers or analyzing data. I think the communication is there when you need it. It's not like you have to call and say hello every week just to call and say hello, but if something comes up where we can help each other, uh, it's very you know, it's straightforward. It's not an obstacle. And you also said, you also alluded to some controversy. So what do you, whenever in science, people, two people that have worked together or worked in the same field for a long time have different notions of what's happening, how easy it is, especially if they're in different stages of their career, for them to be able to communicate with each other, to be able to bash two different ideas, two different notions within the same. I do that with people, I won't say every day, but in my lab, you know, we often, we have our weekly lab meeting, mm -hmm. and one of the things that I encourage is uh, to uh, express different viewpoints about whatever is being discussed that day. Typically, <clears throat> what we'll do in a lab meeting, um, I, I usually, my lab size is about five or six people, that's what I have found to be the optimal group. So on a rotating basis, that means that, oh, if not once a month, at least every, every five or six weeks, somebody, that, that same person will have a chance to present their latest data. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you do, uh, it's the opportunity for everybody in the lab to offer as much critique as possible. Uh, and so I think it's really important to be open to receiving critique. Uh, and sometimes uh, people can be a little bit aggressive. If I see that happening, then I try and dial it back. Uh, I don't want people to attack each other, but I want people to be comfortable with uh, presenting their new ideas uh, and for others to be able to feel comfortable offering what I would call uh, respectful criticism. So, so a difference of opinion in addressing an experimental problem, I think, is essential for doing definitive experiments. If everybody agreed, then you know why do you have to do the next experiment? If there's disagreement, that means we don't understand something, and it drives typically the next experiment that has to be done. So I think it's very healthy, but it has to be done in a positive way rather than in a negative way. And um, another thing that often arises as well is, especially now, but then when you started, as you were saying, it took two years to do the perfect, the, not the perfect experiment, the definitive but the experiment. definitive experiment. Yeah. Do you think that nowadays we have the chance to do that, or do you think there's much more pressure to publish right away the next page? There's, always, pre there's always pressure to publish. Uh, I'm still a very big believer in 
quality rather than quantity. Mm -hmm. And I'd much rather wait until a piece of work is definitive, at least what we think is definitive. Of course, then you have to wait and see what the referees have to say. Um, but one of the nice things about having colleagues, not only the ones that I've developed through working in my lab, but, but for example, I talked about Dr. Jackson, mm -hmm. people that you know and trust, um, is you can, before you send it into review, you can have a colleague look it over and see if they can find any holes and perhaps suggest another experiment or disagree with the conclusion that forces you to go back and do another experiment. So the, the publisher parish, I still am a very strong believer in, in doing the best work you can and waiting until you have a complete story rather than trying to publish the least publishable bit. I, I don't think that that's a helpful thing. The, you'd much rather read a paper and get an understanding of the problem and walk away feeling satisfied that I really learned something rather than uh, saying, well, gosh, you're a little piece of the puzzle, I wonder what the rest of the story is. So, thinking about what do you feel that has been great We had this in one of my slides. I think our greatest publications are the students and the, the postdocs that we train. That's where I think my greatest contributions, if I can say that to the field are, uh, it is perpetuating science and hopefully instilling in young people uh, the, the desire and the ability to attack difficult problems creatively. Um, when somebody comes to work with me, uh, I, I, I don't like being called a boss, although I have to be responsible because I'm and professor, if we can establish uh, a comfortable working relationship with each other so that you're not intimidated if I'm standing next to you looking over your shoulder when you're doing an experiment, and we can sit down and talk openly with each other without you feeling intimidated because I'm a professor and you're a trainee, then we are learning together as colleagues. And in any paper that's come out of my lab, it, it's, not, it's not my product, it's not my student or trainee's product, rather it's a reflection of the interaction that we have together. And I really try and push each person in the lab to be as creative as they can. I don't say, here's your project, do it. What I'll say is, here's the technique, here's how you do the surgery, and they develop the skills. You start developing the course, you do the rest of the course, it falls under the umbrella of what the specific aims are for the grant and what they're funded by. But, but it's up to the individual and I to interpret that and develop it. So when people come and work with me, the first thing I usually try and do is discourage them. <laughs> because it's, it's just plain hard, okay? And I don't mean that in a negative way, uh, and I'm, I'm not trying to scare anybody away, but I want, to, I want them to know how difficult it really is to study the microcirculation. Uh, and if they make up the commitment and the decision to go ahead with it, uh, then they have 110% of support. Um, it takes a long time to get the skill set in place, to be able to do the experiments. You can't come in and expect to get data in a month or six months. Usually there's a solid year of, of learning how to do micro manipulation, of learning how to pull pipettes, of learning how to prepare your instruments so that you can handle 50 or 60 micron vessels. Those are all skills that you need to have in place before you can even do an experiment. Of course, in the background, you're doing a lot of control things. You know, you're playing with dyes, you're learning how to do the electronics, you're learning how to fill microelectrodes, you know, all of the different things. It's not boring. But down the hall, there may be somebody who's doing um, you know, molecular biology or biochemistry where you could do an assay and have data and, and have an abstract in six months after starting. And I tell people that when you start with me, it's going to be at least a year before you're ready to have an abstract, and probably closer to two, just because that's what it takes. And so then it's really up to the individual trainee, be it a student or be a postdoc, whether they're willing to make that investment up front. And, and that's what I have to uh, make them aware of. I say I, um, not really scare them away, but just make them realize how difficult it is to get what you need in place to be able to study the microcirculation rigorously. And I don't think that there are a lot of labs that offer that kind of training. So uh, it's, it's, it's a niche. Our societies are not thousands of people. Uh, we have, I think, the U.S. Society and the British Society each have about 250 members. 
uh, there are many people out there who are studying microcirculation who don't belong to our societies and we're making a big effort now uh, to incorporate them. Uh, each organ has its own special kind of microcirculation. And so I think the opportunities for studying the microcirculation are extraordinary. Any disease in the body must have some component that's related to the microcirculation. And uh, I think as, as uh, science is being more translationally driven, um, if we pay attention to the kinds of questions that are being asked by physicians about how to treat patients, and think of how we can bring the microcirculation into that context, and design experiments from the microcirculatory perspective to address questions in disease, uh, I think that's really where the future is. And I think there's tremendous opportunity for young people to develop in that direction. So I think that's a wonderful note to finish our little interview. I'd like to invite you to join us for Thanks for the opportunity. Okay. Thank you very much for your advice. My pleasure. Thank you.